The New York Mets are simply unwatchable right now. Is there anything they could do to get fans to tune back in? We'll talk about it on today's show. You are Locked On Mets, your daily New York Mets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello to all you amazing Mets fans. You're watching Locked On Mets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host, Ryan Ficklestein. If you want to find any of my work, follow me on Twitter, Ficklestein Ryan. Also find some of my writing at JustBaseball.com, where I work as the managing editor. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code LOCKEDONMLB for $20 off your first purchase. Last-minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Well, the New York Mets played the Atlanta Braves this weekend, and if you didn't tune in, I don't blame you, but I think this series went pretty much as you could have expected. They got destroyed. They got embarrassed game after game after game. Yes, they did win one on Sunday, but before that, uh, any pride you could have taken in the Mets, which is long gone anyway, was just shattered to pieces, and it's just an unwatchable brand of baseball across the board. I'm trying to rack my brain as to the last time the Mets have been this unwatchable. And I don't even know because 2018, which is the last really bad season the New York Mets had, you know, Jacob DeGrom at least won a Cy Young and you got to watch him pitch every five days. So there was some stuff there. And yeah, sure, there's a couple good players left. And I like watching Kodai Senga pitch. And I like watching Jose Quintana pitch. And those are a couple games a week where you say, hey, the Mets actually have a little bit of a chance. And you still got Pete Alonso having a nice year where he might hit 50 home runs. And you got Francisco Lindor, who's putting together a good season as well, even if Mets fans don't really seem to appreciate him, despite the fact that you know, most things would, would tell you if you look at wins above replacement and where he ranks among shortstops and home runs and RBIs and all these different statistics, the guy's one of the best shortstops in baseball. But who cares? Who cares? You have a couple good players, but this team is brutal. And you start a series on Friday night, Tyler McGill takes the mound. He gives up five earned runs, six runs overall. And, and talking about futility, the Mets reached base 16 times and failed to score a run. 16 base runners, zero runs. How? How? It doesn't even add up. It's something that hasn't been done in, when it comes to the Mets since I think it was 1976. It is baffling. And then you have a doubleheader. And if you were saying, all right, I'm going to watch the second game because I don't really care to see Denny Reyes pitch because he was the one who started for the Mets on Saturday. And you just happen to peek at your phone halfway through the game. You see the Mets are you know losing by a couple touchdowns. And they end up losing by a football score of 21 to three. A Daniel Vogel back home run in the eighth inning was the only difference, keeping it from a 21 to nothing shutout in baseball. In baseball, game two on Saturday, Jose Quintana, like I said, he's fun to watch pitch. Six strong innings for the Mets, gives up one run. He was the loser in that game because once again, the Mets were shut out. And their bullpen gave up five runs as a Quintana left. Three innings of work. Sunday, you're going to see Kodai Senga. He gives up three runs in the first inning. So if you were tuned in and you were like, all right, at least I'll watch the Senga start. It's almost like watching DeGrom in 2018. Not on the same level, of course, but just, hey, he's the one guy that's a really good pitcher that you can watch and maybe at least fantasize about the next you know, four years that saying could be pitching with the Mets uniform on and how he could eventually be part of some good teams, right? Gives up those runs early. A lot of people probably just turned the game off. Now, the Mets end up winning. Uh, they had a ridiculous, uh, was it the fifth inning? Uh, yeah, fifth inning where they scored the six runs. But it's not like it was home runs or anything flashy. There was some base hits. There was a lot of walks. Two of the runs came in via bases loaded walks. One came in from a catcher's interference, and then a Rafael Ortega hit 
capped off the rally. Snooze fest. You score six runs in an inning to win a game against the Braves, and I'm calling it a snooze fest because it was. And guess what? The Mets still almost blew that game in the end. They barely hang on seven to six. This is a team that has been playing Rafael Ortega every day and Danny Mendick every day. You're seeing DJ Stewart a lot and Jonathan Aruiz. And man, this is a team full of guys that you're going to look back in three years and say, oh, that guy played for the Mets? And there's a reason for all of it. The Mets are tanking. That's what they're doing. They are blatantly tanking. It's like watching the NBA team that has a roster of, you know, seven power forwards and five centers and no one can handle the ball. And they're just out there you know, running out the clock of the season, hoping for a lottery ball to fall in their favor. That's what the Mets are. That's what they're doing. And it's making it painful to try to watch baseball. It's so brutal at this point. I mean, you might as well just hop on the Marlins bandwagon in your division, whatever. At least you'd watch some fun games because I'll tell you, tuning into the Mets down the stretch here, it's just going to continue to be a miserable experience. And, hey, you know, they played a great team this weekend, and they did win a series before that. But, again, the collection of names that they're running out there, both pitching and hitting, it is – Worse than a a triple-A roster. And they could be kind of fun. One of the stupidest things I ever tweeted was the day of the deadline. I thought the Mets would actually be an entertaining team down the stretch because I thought, hey, you're going to see Mark Vientos every day. You're going to see Alvarez. You might see Mauricio. It's going to be young guys, and they're just going to have nothing to play for. But, you know, they'll be playing spoiler against some other teams, and maybe it'll be a, a nice ride to close out the year. And instead, you're watching Rafael Ortega every day. And it's just awful. And the thing is, they could do what they're trying to to accomplish here as far as tanking and still put some players on the field that you'd want to watch. But Ronnie Mauricio is still in AAA. And not that he's going to save any season, but... Are you really worried about service time that much with, with Ronnie Mauricio that you don't want to just give your fans a little carrot for a couple months? Especially when you could get that year back by, I don't know, having them in the minor leagues when your team's good next year. I want to talk about what would make us as fans actually want to tune into the Mets and see if they actually do it. Before we get to that, though, ironically enough, I'm going to tell you about game time. Okay. Uh, you know, maybe you want to see a concert. Maybe you want to go a- a- and see like a comedy show. It- it's hard for me to say, hey, go to the ballpark. But here's the thing if you do want to watch Mets baseball, game time's there for you. It's fast and easy way to buy tickets. And I'll tell you what, everyone's probably trying to sell their tickets right now. So you can get some absolutely killer deals. Take the family out to a game. You won't have to spend too much money. And they have the best price guarantee. So you're going to get the absolute best price wherever you're sitting with the game time guarantee. If you find tickets in the same section and row for less, game time is going to credit you 110% of the difference. It's the fastest growing ticketing app in the country for a reason. Damages your seats before you buy, so you know exactly what to expect when you arrive. Buy tickets in a matter of seconds. Two taps, you're all set. Tickets are sent directly to your phone, so you never have to dig through your email. You can snag tickets without the stress by downloading the game time app, create an account. Use the code Locked MLB for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account, redeem the code Locked on MLB for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. The New York Mets for the Pittsburgh Pirates, seven ten Eastern Time tonight. Catch every pitch of the Mets hometown broadcast with Sirius XM on the SXM app. Just search Mets. Now, last week I left you. On the first edition of Locked On Binghamton Rumble Ponies, we were talking about the Mets double-A affiliate, and I want to pick up where I left off there a little bit here because there's a pitcher on that roster that I want to see in the big leagues, and I've been you know, banging my drum for it for a couple weeks now, and I want to stay on this because I think there's a guy that has a chance to be 
a piece for the Mets in the future in their rotation who you could get a look at right now and it would make your product a lot better. It would excite fans who actually pay tickets and go to the ballpark and give them something better than Denny Reyes or Tyler McGill. And it would give you a chance to take a look at a guy that you know might actually be able to help you in a massive way next year. I'm talking about Christian Scott. So, again, where I left you off last week, we were going through the Binghamton Rubble Pony season, and they were playing over the weekend the Somerset Patriots. It's you know week long series, so it's it's a, a series that spans six games. They took the first two games of the series, and then on Thursday night, uh, the night I recorded the episode, they lost fourteen to nothing. Tyler Stewart, who had been leading the minor leagues all year in ERA, got rocked. Friday night, the Rumble Ponies lost nine to nothing. Sunday they lost eight to nothing. So three shutouts that they lost, and they gave up against that team, which is the Yankees AAA affiliate that's been the best team in that league all year. They gave up, was it 23, 31 runs? Yes, 31 runs in those three games, the last four games of that series. Okay, you don't want the game that they won, though? It was on Saturday, and Christian Scott was on the mound. He went six and a third. He allowed just one hit, no earned runs, had five strikeouts, and did not walk a batter. He threw 65 strikes out of his 94 pitches. He's now made 10 starts in double-A. He's pitched to a 2.67 ERA. He has 69 strikeouts, which is super nice, compared to just eight walks and 57 and a third innings pitched. He's been awesome. And his control is amazing right now. He's not walking many batters. He has a great feel for his pitches. He's the type of guy that could make that jump, in my opinion, and could probably surprise some people. And I guess it doesn't matter, right? If you are all into a rebuild for this year and reset and, and repurposing the investment, Steve Cohen's dollars and all that stuff, if that's really what you're doing, then I understand them being as all in on that as possible. And it's going to be a miserable end to the season for Mets fans, but you weren't going anywhere anyway. And Hey, it's important. Okay. To, to tank. And I, I, and for those of you who didn't listen to my episode, I think it was last Monday about it. This is actually something the Mets have to do in some respects, because being a luxury tax team, if they fall out of the top six, if they're not one of the six teams that gets a lottery ball picked for them, they are going to have that pick drop 10 slots. So you will have a season that's miserable where the Mets you know, might barely win 70 games when it's all said and done. And they could drop from pick seven or eight to 17 or 18. Now, if they're in the top six, okay, you're good. You get to keep your pick. So I do understand why the Mets are trying to lose. But I don't think that putting Christian Scott in your rotation is going to change that. Because guess what? After Christian Scott goes five scoreless, the bullpen behind him, just throw out you know, Jimmy Yacobonis. I think he pitched well this weekend. Whatever. Throw anybody else out there. You know, find... You know, see what uh, what was that guy from a couple years ago? Find Jared Eikhoff and put him in there. Why don't you bring Dylan Bundy up? Who you had it in your farm system for a minute until you got destroyed. Put him in your bullpen. Just have have a tanking pitcher. You know, put Danny Mendick in a one run game. Why not? Just be blatantly obvious. But at least give me six innings of baseball that I'd actually like to watch. With Christian Scott and you could also have Mike Vassell's another guy that fans would like to see. To me. It's about someone who's ready to to jump into a big league rotation. And as crazy as it is that I'm saying after 10 double A starts, Scott's there. Mike Vassell, who's in AAA right now, is pitching to a 5-4 ADRA. And he didn't pitch well on Sunday either. Went five and two-thirds, allowed three runs off four hits and three walks. He's still walking way too many batters. I don't think that he would come up and be successful. And again, I actually kind of think Scott would. And it would just make the product a little bit better. Now, other players who you could see down the stretch that would make games more exciting. Brett Beatty coming back. Are we going to see that? I doubt it. He has homered twice in four games back in AAA. 
but you can gain a whole year of service time on him. You can get a whole extra year of control by holding him in the minor leagues. I think they're probably going to do that. And honestly, I don't even think that it's the, the wrong decision, but it's one less player for your future that, that you're not going to be able to see play baseball games. So then there's Ronnie Mauricio who had a two home run game on Friday night. Why not call him up? I get the whole thing again. If I just said something about service time with Beatty, it could apply to Mauricio. I don't think you have to worry about Ronnie Mauricio on the 2030 Mets. I really don't. I think that somebody else is. I, I think that Mauricio will either be on another team by then or, or something else will, will, will work out where that won't matter. If he's amazing, you sign him to an extension at some point. But that's still counting, you know, way too far in advance. Fans want to see this guy. He's clearly earned a promotion. He's done everything he had to in AAA. Um, are his numbers outstanding compared to the league when you look at Waiter Runs Created Plus and a league that has so much offense where he has good numbers but not great compared to other guys around him? Sure. Would it be nice to see what he looks like and get to MLB pitching for a month and a half? Yes, it would. Lastly, Luke Ritter. He's leading the Mets minor leagues in home runs this year. He's in AAA. He's not necessarily even considered a prospect because he's an older guy. I don't have his age in front of me. I think he's 26, if I'm not mistaken. He's got a 423 on base percentage in August. Like, why not? I'd rather see Luke Ritter, who maybe has a chance to be you know, a, a utility guy for the Mets for a couple years if, if everything breaks right. I'd rather see him getting playing time than... Danny Mendick or, uh, you know, Rafael Ortega. And with Jeff McNeil, you know, play Jeff McNeil in center field for all I care, honestly. I just feel like there's some players that you could call up that would make these games a little less frustrating. They'll give you at least a couple more at-bats a game that you want to watch or a guy who starts every fifth day that you're excited to tune in on. And instead, they are so committed to tanking, which is what I think it's pretty obvious they're doing at this point that they are putting the worst product on the field possible. And guess what? If the Mets end up winning the lottery and they have a top six pick and even better if they're on you know, the top three or something crazy, hey, it was all worth it. And, and Mets baseball in the future is going to be better for it. But the current product is just disaster. Now, I want to close the show today on the biggest story of the weekend, I guess, which was that Justin Verlander is a diva. Uh, I'll talk about that one in a minute. First, though, another word from our sponsors. So the New York Post came out with an article over the weekend talking about Justin Verlander being a diva who rubbed teammates and particularly Max Scherzer the wrong way. An anonymous met <coughs> Scherzer. <coughs> Scherzer. <coughs> Sorry, I had Max Scherzer's name caught my throat. An anonymous met went to the New York Post and blasted Justin Verlander a little bit. He was a diva that he uh, thought that the Mets analytics department was way behind the Astros and you know was was not happy with that and that he was basically the the root uh, of a clubhouse that was dysfunctional that maybe led to lost baseball games. Well, the report is the report. When teams lose, the clubhouse is not in a good place. I feel like it's that simple. Look at Francisco Lindor and Jeff McNeil in particular. 2021, at each other's throats. The team was bad. The team was struggling. The team was just frequently in frustrating situations. Frustration boils over. Look at 2022. They're... Best friends all of a sudden. I don't know if I, maybe that's going a bit too far, but they're in a great place. They're, they're winning games together and all is fine as well. Now this year, not to say that it, the two of them are, are having issues or they're the reason for any clubhouse dysfunction, but when you lose games, people generally aren't happy. Justin Verlander being a diva and all that, I think the biggest question is, was that a big mistake, right? Was the, the signing of Justin Verlander something the Mets, if you go back in time, would you do that differently? And where I land on it is no. For one, the result of Justin Verlander now 
is you got arguably the top two prospects in the Astros farm system. Drew Gilbert is now a top two prospect, or I guess top two or three, depending on which source you look at, um, prospect in the Mets system. A really good defensive center fielder who everyone says plays with his hair on fire, who, you know, if everything breaks right, could be up midway through next season. Ryan Clifford is the prospect now in the Mets system that I think has a chance to be the best player out of any of them. A guy that I think before too long will be the top prospect in the system because, for one, you have Acuna and you have Gilbert who will graduate at some point, you would think, over the next, you know, if not calendar year, a little bit beyond that. And that'll knock him up a couple of pegs. But also, he's just tearing the cover off the ball this season. He hit his 20th home run at 19. Well, he's now 20. He just turned 20, though, not that long ago. And he's got 20 bombs in, in high A. Unbelievable stuff. So because of that trade, yes, everything worked out. Now, getting back to the signing and trying to win this year, which is what you know, signing Justin Verlander was supposed to do. Look at the other options they had. The top of that market was Carlos Rodon. It was Justin Verlander, and it was Jacob deGrom. Rodon's been awful and hurt. deGrom hurt Tommy John, second one at his age. And Verlander was good. He pitched well. I'm not going to blame everything on him this season. Like an anonymous Met maybe tried to in, in some respects. Lastly, when it comes to this, you know, if you think about what was great for the Mets last year, now I've seen a lot of people saying, oh, the Mets should have signed Chris Bassett. Right? They should have brought Bassett back. Should have just been Bassett and Sanga. And hindsight is 2020. If the Mets did that and they went into the season with the rotation of Scherzer, Senga, and Bassett, they would probably be in a better position right now than they ended up being in. But that is completely being armed with hindsight. And every fan that says they want that now would have been livid in the offseason if the guy replacing Jacob deGrom was just Kodai Senga and you were running it back with Bassett and Scherzer as your one and two, so to speak. And Bassett didn't pitch well in the playoffs last year. That's why you got Verlander because you wanted another big playoff game pitcher. And now the funny thing is, I think going into next season, they're going to try to sign the Bassett type. I think they maybe learned that, you know what? Get your high floor arms. Make it through the season the best you can. Hope that some of them can win you a playoff game. But there's other ways to, to really get there as a team. And part of it is having the lockdown bullpen. And also you always have that opportunity at the deadline. If you have a team in the mix to make a move for a starter then. So you can always look back and say things should have been done differently. But when you look at that starting pitching uh, market, the Mets actually did great. Honestly, um, if Jose Quintana didn't get hurt, and you know, Verlander also didn't get hurt at the beginning of the year. If those injuries didn't happen and they had healthy versions of them from day one, I think it's probably a completely different season. Um, and we're going to talk about that free agent you know, coup from the Mets and, and how they did um, on a future episode this week. On tomorrow's show, though, I want to talk about the thing that really broke this team down. Edwin Diaz, uh, we're going to go through you know, that impact of losing Edwin and if he should pitch this season because – Seems like he is getting, uh, I wouldn't say close to return, but close to the point where it's a conversation to be had. So we'll have that conversation tomorrow for all you everydayers. Make sure you follow, rate, and review wherever you get your podcast. Follow me on Twitter at Finkelstein Ryan. Follow the show, Locked on Mets. Thank you for making Locked on Mets your first listen every day. If you want to catch every pitch of the Mets hometown broadcast this week, you can do so with SiriusXM on the SXM app. Just search Mets.